Hi, my name's Cheese, and today I'm going to show you how to create custom balls for the free and open source game Neverball. For the purposes of this tutorial, I'm going to assume that you've downloaded Neverball via Git and have successfully compiled it. For building instructions, check out the Neverball forums. In this video, we're going to look at three types of customization. A simple reskin, adding custom geometry to the default basic ball, and creating a multi-part ball with three differently moving parts. You can find these balls, plus some other examples, on GitHub. Check the end of the presentation or the video description for URLs. To start with, let's look at how a Neverball ball is defined. Existing balls can be found in the data folder under Ball. In this case, we're going to look at the Compass Ball, a ball that we'll be making later on in the tutorial. As you can see, we have a number of files here. Neverball balls are typically made up of one or more of three compiled BSP maps. The solid map rolls with the ball as it moves through the level, whilst the inner and outer maps have the option of being non-rotational or swinging like a pendulum. OBJ files are a text representation of 3D models. For Neverball, they have to include normal direction, UV mapping, and faces must be triangulated. Balls also require textures or sprites, as well as material files controlling lighting and reflectiveness, as well as other features like face smoothing and transparency. All of these become compiled together into SOL files, which the game reads. The first ball that we'll look at making is a simple reskin, taking the default basic ball and applying a different texture to give it a different look and feel. First up, let's take a look at what the ball looks like in-game before customization. As we can see, the ball is checkered and transparent, giving a very clear and readable sense of movement as it rolls through the level. This pattern was inspired by the markings on the Mercury Redstone rockets, which sent some of the earliest humans into space. If we open up the default texture, we can see that it uses an equirectangular projection. This means that the top and bottom will be squished together at the poles, whilst the middle will remain undistorted around the equator. We're going to replace this pattern with a new texture featuring the continents of the world overlaid over the same markings. The simplest way to do this is just to rename the new image to use the original texture's file name. In this case, that's basic-ball.png. Launching the game again, we can see that our changes have taken effect immediately. This is because the texture, unlike the other ball components, isn't compiled into the SOL file. Whilst this might be an easy way of testing new textures, it destroys the original ball in the process. The better option is to create a new ball that references the basic ball's geometry. Let's restore the original texture by renaming the files again. If we open up basic-ball-solid.map, we can see how the map file imports the basic ball geometry. The map file's first element is the root node, which uses the world spawn class name. In this ball, the second element uses the misc model class name, and defines the obj model to be imported, as well as the material file, which defines the texture and the lighting to be used. We're going to make a new folder in the ball directory called world-ball, and create world-ball-solid.map. Recreate the content of basic-ball-solid.map being sure to enclose elements in curly braces and close all quotes. At this point, the only thing we want to change is the material property of the misc model element. Instead of using the path to the basic-ball material, we'll change it to ball-world-ball-world-ball. The model property will still point to the original obj at ball-basic-ball-basic-ball.obj. Save this, and then we'll move on to creating our material file. Create a new file called world-ball. In this, we're going to define diffuse, ambient, specular, and emissive light in RGBA values, as well as shininess, auto-smoothing angle, and other material flags. For the diffuse property, we'll set the red, green, blue, and alpha flags all to 1. And for the ambient, specular, and emissive properties, we'll set the RGB values to 0.2 and the alpha value to 1. We're going to set the shininess to 20, use the transparent flag, and set the auto smoothing angle to 45 degrees. If there is a PNG image which uses the same file name as the material, it will automatically be used. The next step is to compile our ball into an SOL file. We do this using Neverball's mapc command. Map C takes two command line parameters. The first is the path to the map file that you want to compile, 
and the second is the path to Neverball's data folder. If compilation is successful, MAPC will output a summary of the entities and geometry compiled within. You should also have a .sol file in your ball folder. After launching Neverball again, we should be able to see our new ball in the ball selection screen under the options menu. The game will automatically detect a ball when it finds an SOL file with the same name as its parent folder, followed by dash solid, dash inner, or dash outer. For our next ball, we will use the 3D modeling program Blender to create the interior shape of a cat's eye marble. To start with, let's import the original ball's geometry to give us a sense of scale. Go to the file menu, select import, and then wavefront obj. Once the ball is imported, Press the spacebar to bring up the context menu, type add plane, and then hit enter. This plane will become one side of the interior shape of the cat's eye marble. Before we move on to any modeling, select the materials tab from the properties pane and click new. Then select the texture tab, click new, and select image or movie from the type dropdown. Click the open button from the image section and select the texture we'll be using for the cat's eye. With the new material now created, bring up the UV slash image editor pane. From the UV editor's image drop-down, select our texture. Move the cursor over the 3D view and press tab to enter edit mode. With all of the vertices selected, press space to bring up the context menu again, type unwrap and hit enter. This will define how the texture is to be applied to the plane. Since we're going to distort the plane, it's easier to do it now than later. Press tab to exit edit mode. Then select the ball and press tilt to bring up the move to layer dialog. Select the second layer to move the ball there so that it doesn't obscure our plane. If you like, you can select textured mode from the viewport shading drop down to see how the plane looks with the texture applied. Press Z to return to wireframe mode, then hit Ctrl R and Escape to perform a loop cut in the center of the plane. Perform additional loop cuts above and below our first one to divide the plane into four faces vertically. Press A to deselect any selected vertices, then press B to use the box selection tool, then click and drag to select the top and bottom most vertices. Press S to scale, X to constrain to the X axis, and 0 on the number pad to move them together horizontally. Press B to use the box selection tool again to select the middle six vertices. Press S, X, and scale inwards to create a narrow shape. Select the vertices in horizontal pairs and reposition them using S for scaling, R for rotating, and G for moving. Add additional loop cuts in if you feel that the shape needs it. When the shape looks vaguely right, select the Modifiers tab from the Properties pane, and choose Subdivision Surface from the Add Modifier drop-down. This will turn our blocky shape into a nice smooth one. Increase the view value to 2 and do any additional tweaking that you'd like. If we go into Textured View again, and rotate the viewport so that we can see the back of the plane, We'll see that it doesn't have any faces. In edit mode, press A to select all vertices, then Shift D to duplicate them. In the tool shelf, find the normals section and click the flip direction button. With their normals flipped, the duplicated faces now cover the back of the plane. Switch back to wireframe mode. Select the vertices in pairs again, then press 7 on the number pad to switch to a top down view. Press R to rotate and add some twist to our shape. Once we're happy, press Z to enter smooth shading mode, and we can see that our shape could benefit from some smoothing. In edit mode, select all of the vertices, then find the shading section on the tool shelf and click the smooth button. If we go into textured mode, we can see it's looking pretty good. Press 7 to return to top down view. If you're still in edit mode, press tab to return to object mode. Press shift D to duplicate our shape, and then R to rotate it slightly past 90 degrees. If we rotate the viewport around, we can see that the two shapes intersect. We'd like the shapes to cross over where the texture is at its darkest, so press Z to return to wireframe mode, and then with the duplicate selected, press Tab to enter edit mode. Adjust the vertices until the intersection looks good, then move the mouse over the UV editor pane. Press G and then Y to move the selected vertices in the UV editor upwards onto the second color. Press Tab to return to object mode, and select both shapes. Press space to bring up the context menu, and type join and hit enter. Our two shapes have been combined into one, and are now ready for export. If we select the second layer holding down shift, and enter wireframe mode, 
we can get an idea of what the shape is going to look like inside the ball. Hide the ball by clicking on the first layer again. Then go to the File menu and select Wavefront OBJ from the Export menu. Enter Catseye-Ball as the file name to export and then scroll down to the Export OBJ options. Make sure that Selected Only, Apply Modifiers, Include Normals and Triangulate Faces are ticked and uncheck Write Materials. Click the Export button and our work in Blender is done. I've already created the material and map files. If we open up catseye-solid.map, we can see that it has a second MISC model entity, which references the OBJ that we just exported. You should also note that the first MISC model element uses a material from the snow globe ball. This material is more transparent and allows the geometry within to be more visible. The last thing that we need to do is compile the ball using map C. Once again, passing the path to the map file that we want to compile and never ball's data folder. After launching the game, we can see our new ball in all its glory after choosing it from the ball selection screen from the options menu. If we wanted to improve this ball, we could change its starting orientation by rotating the geometry in Blender or choosing different forward and up axes when exporting to OBJ. The final ball that we'll be looking at combines dash solid, dash inner, and dash outer dot map to create a ball with three distinctly differently moving parts. I've already created a model in Blender, which consists of an outer ring and an inner compass. These are separate objects which I've exported separately as different OBJs. If we open up compass-ball-solid.map, we can see that it is more or less the same as the basic ball, except that it uses the snow globe texture that we used in the previous cat's eye ball. This part of the ball will roll around as we have seen in the previous balls we've looked at. Compass-ball-outer.map looks similar but uses the pendulum option in the world spawn entity. This allows the geometry to swing like a pendulum when the ball hits an obstacle or changes direction. The MISC model entity imports the outer ring, which is called compass-outer.obj. It also uses a compass material, which is shared by both the outer and the inner portions of the ball. Compass-ball-solid.map is similar again, but sets the pendulum option of the world spawn entity to zero. This will mean that the geometry will be non-rotational and will maintain its orientation as the ball moves around. Perfect for a compass. The MISC model entity uses our compass texture again and imports geometry from compass-inner.obj. Each of the three map files needs to be compiled individually using map C. I've already done this, so let's launch the game and see how the compass looks. We can see straight away that the inner portion of the compass maintains its orientation. As we turn, we can see that the outer ring rotates with us, but sways as though it has its own momentum. And that concludes our tutorial. It's not intended to be definitive, but I hope that it's encouraged you to experiment with making your own balls. If you do make something of your own, I'd love to hear about it. Please consider posting it in the Neverball forums, or you can find me on Twitter as at Valiant Cheese. Don't forget that you can download the balls featured in this tutorial, as well as some other examples, from GitHub. You can find the Neverball source code on GitHub as well, and you can find more details on ball creation on the Neverball forums. This tutorial was originally given as a talk at the December 2013 TASLUG meeting. Here you can see balls that I created in preparation for the talk, as well as some that were created during the meeting based on suggestions. Thanks for watching, and enjoy making your own balls!